Okay, thank you for attending this uh, presentation. So uh, my name is Jean-Michel Fried, and I want to talk to you about uh, fascinating convergence of technologies. Uh, we have reached a point now where on the one hand we have basically infinite computational power. Uh, everyone has a very fast computer uh, on his desk. And on the other hand, we've got this proliferation of uh, small unmanned aerial vehicles fitted with high quality cameras. And I want to uh, talk you through the generation of digital elevation models, georeferenced digital elevation models, um, using such kinds of uh, UAV. So I want to show you a bit what software can be used, what are the flight requirements, and uh, here's an example of two uh, measurements that were done. So to give you an idea of the area that I'll be interested in, that's about a 40 meter scale. So we're talking about areas of like a few hundred meters side, uh, pixel resolution, sub decimeter. And here's an example of uh, braiding and, uh, and uh, uh, flow change of, of a small river uh, between two weeks uh, where you can have aerial uh, images uh, with short repetition time. So I want to get through uh, this discussion about how to uh, generate such uh, autophotos and digital elevation models using small unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, that's actually a sequel to the presentation I made at Force4G French uh, last summer. Uh, unfortunately, the tutorial I wrote at the time was in French. I had planned on translating this for FOSDEM. I haven't got time yet to do so, so if anyone is interested in getting uh, this tutorial in English, of course, feel free to send an email and I'll be happy to translate it for you. So why am I doing this? Uh, basically, my basic input for geomorphological investigations or uh, any kind of georeference uh, investigation that I'm interested in is using uh, elevation as a basic input. Uh, whether I'm instruction interested in uh, measuring landslides, uh, glacier, that's what I'm interested in, glacier melt, uh, material transport, flooding, that kind of information. Now, if you just rely on uh, global digital elevation models such as SRTM or GDAL, you have what I would consider low resolution from my perspective, digital elevation models, which are typically three second arc over most of the world, one second arc uh, over the US for SRTM. So we're talking about 30, 90 meter resolution, lateral resolution. Uh, and additional, usually you have one digital elevation model. So if you want to make difference of digital elevation models, you need to find some way of having repeated digital elevation models, which are usually not available. So what I'm interested in here is how can I generate local digital, digital elevation models, which means what I mean by local is less than 10 square kilometer area. What I'm interested in is high resolution, sub decimeter uh, pixel size, and high update, uh, high update rate, let's say one DEM every week or every month, uh, so that I can make uh, subtraction of digital elevation model and see material movement or, or changes of uh, elevation uh, of, of my area. Additionally, since I'm, this all started as a hobby, and as usual, hobby gets more and more into the work, uh, I'm interested in low-cost low equipment. What I mean low-cost, I started this with a less than 100 euro, uh, one of these toys that you can buy uh, at Christmas, and slowly I'm getting into more involved equipment. Now I'm doing this with DJI uh, drones, but I'm, I'm talking about sub-kilo uh, euro equipment. So the challenge that I will be totally telling to you about is that we will have to handle a huge amount of images. Typically, we're going to acquire 600, 1,000 images per flight. So huge, that might not make sense to you, but uh, 600 to 1,000 images at high resolution images of typically five, six megabytes per image, we're talking about six, seven gigabytes worth uh, of uh, images to process. Uh, the generated DEM, we're talking about 10 square kilometer with sub decimeter resolution. We're going to have gigabyte, gigabyte uh, sized uh, uh, orthophotos. So I find this a bit challenging to, to handle. Now, this means that hardly we'll be able to handle a uh, graphical user interface because such data sets would be horrendously slow to render. So I will be presenting to you a tool, a command line interface that's been developed by uh, the French National Geographic Institute, EGN, which I'm not totally unrelated to, but uh, uh, I, I, got the, um, I fell in love with the software that they developed. Uh, Marc Pio de Siligny is in charge of this uh, development uh, uh, in one of the labs of, of EGN. And I want to introduce you this software because at first it might be uh, a bit, uh, you might get a bit afraid when you have a look at, at uh, Micmac. And I want to show you step by step how powerful the approach uh, relevant to the Unix philosophy of one tool for one solution and not a fully integrated uh, tool uh, will allow you to, on the one hand, handle this huge data set and on the other hand, know exactly what you're doing. Uh, for each step, we have one tool for each step, which means we have an output which tells us if 
this step was successful. If it failed, then we have to find the reason. But there is no point in continuing the processing if one step of the processing failed. This will get clear, I think, next in the next slide. But before we start processing images, we need to acquire images. So just let me emphasize how compliance with regulations is important. If you're just doing this for fun, you might or might not comply with regulations. When it gets into your job, you must comply with regulations. In my case, I'm, 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 I'm flying north of Norway. I need to uh, get the, uh, of course, flight uh, allowance, so exam. Uh, I need to get flight authorization from civilian authority. This is a 30-page document uh, that you have to fill. You have to check with the defense ministry if they agree that you take pictures. Uh, this is the militarized zone that where I'm flying, so uh, defense ministry doesn't care. You have to check that you're not harassing wildlife, so uh, this kind of uh, activity you have to check to get authorization to fly. Once you get all the authorizations, you have to plan your flight. So flight planning for uh, making digital elevation model requires that you have enough surface coverage from one picture to the other. So basically you make, must make sure that your pictures overlap by at least 60%. Typically, Micmac says you should have 80% overlap. So once you have decided what is your horizontal velocity, in my case, typically 10 meters per second, and you know your altitude over the area, then you can calculate how often you have to take an image. In my case, for example, I'm flying with a coverage of 100 meters. I'm flying at 10 meters per second. I need to acquire one picture about every two seconds. So this is why a 20-minute flight will generate 600 to 900 images. Now, once you've acquired your images, you can do this manually. This is what I originally did because I wanted to track some features. I wanted to track some river. Or we can automate the flight. But in all cases, you have the angular uh, coverage of your uh, camera. You know the altitude. So you can, uh, by knowing the uh, resolution of your uh, camera, you can compute the pixel size. And you see that a UAV flying at 100 meter high with a 4,000 pixel uh, uh, resolution will typically create a, a DEM with pixel size 4 centimeter. I'm not saying that the DEM will have 4 centimeter resolution, but at least your, picture, your pixel size will be 4 centimeter. And of course, now we have automated software. This is ITZUR, one of the uh, free software that you can use for, to define the, the flight. So you just have to uh, define the two corners of your flight, uh, take off the drone, uh, get a coffee, and come back 20 meters later to uh, uh, land the drone. In this case, it's not landing automatically. You have to bring it back manually. So we've collected all these images. Each one of these dots is an uh, image. How do we process this image to create a DEM? First thing, either you're using a DJI or a georeference uh, camera, and it's easy. You have an exit tag, and you've got the uh, GPS position in your image. Alternatively, you're putting a high-quality camera, which does not have GPS. You've got, an, on, on the other hand, a GPS recorder. What, you, what I'm doing uh, is I'm using EXIF2, uh, the uh, common line interface, uh, EXIF2 software, for tagging uh, my images. So I can say, OK, if you check the header of your uh, image, you know what the image is when you take a clock. In this case, this is a GPS discipline clock at uh, observatory close to our place. And uh, this gives me, I have the header of the image, I have the GPS time, I can compute the difference between my camera time and my GPS time, and then Exif tool gives you the option minus geosync, and you can give it uh, a whole NMEA log, NMEA log file, a directory where your images are, and Exif tool will take care of geotagging all your images. So once we've got this set of geotagged images, I will need to inform my processing software, we'll see why in the next step, uh, where each picture was taken. So this must be done in a projected, pro projected referential. In my case, I'm flying in northern Norway. Norway is UTM 33 North. So I will convert all my uh, positions, my WGS 9484 uh, NMEA log into a projected framework. And I will create a file, an ASCII file, in which I have longitude, latitude, altitude, and file name. You will notice that I remove uh, a big offset. Uh, Northern Norway is something like a million meter, uh, sorry, 100,000 meter north. So I remove all this offset here. Uh, otherwise, you have rounding error in the processing. So you just keep the relevant decimals of your position and uh, file name, and you convert this text file from uh, a text file into XML. Uh, uh, 
and micmac is uh, always prefixed with mm3d so all commands are mm3d and i want to convert the orientation uh, from a text file which is here to an xml file and we will see that we need to select a subset of images for calibrating the lens properties so we say we're going to use as a reference image uh, this particular image which meets some of the requirements namely that there is a maximum elevation variation in, the, in this image and i want to take 25 images to calibrate the lens um, so this is pretty much what you, you will always do. You will always have MM3D, what, what, what command you want to use, and the options to create uh, whatever steps you want. So the first thing I want to do is, why do I need to use the GPS position of each camera? The first thing that uh, a software, processing software will need is type points, meaning points that are matching on both images so that uh, the, the software can say, okay, this same image was, uh, this same point was taken from different points of view. Now, if you just do this stupidly on a, on a 600 picture data set and you just say, I want to correlate all possible uh, pairs, then you find out that you need uh, like 200,000 matching steps. And each one of these matching steps is taking something like a second. So you're going to spend a few days just finding the tie points. But you have a good, very strong assumption. You know that this image will most probably not have any similar point with this one because they are so far away. So what we can tell here is you tell Micmac, OK, just consider images that are adjacent in their GPS position. So this is why we computed this file previously. So we're going to ask Micmac to use the tapioca tool using the file, the file that we just generated previously. Um, I export the text file so that I can draw these images in, uh, in QGIS. And I ask it to only use the pairs of closest images. So by doing this, instead of having 200,000 points, you only have 10,000 pairs to analyze much, much faster. And here I drew the pairs that Micmac has identified. It makes sense. So the algorithm is working pretty well. And by doing this, Micmac is going to search for points that are matching in both pairs. So here are two adjacent images. And if you follow the arrows on, the, uh, on your right, you see that the uh, vector of motion of the, between the two images is indeed properly computed. So Micmac has selected relevant points on this image and computed where these, where these points have moved from one image to the other. This will be the basic input that we will need. So here you see first step, verify that indeed the tie point identification has worked properly. If you have very smooth areas or features that are uh, similar in multiple pictures, this step will not work properly. You can draw the arrows and you can check that this is working properly. Now we've got the tie points. Next step, we need to model the lens. We have a UAV. I bought a cheap toy. Uh, I have no characteristics of my lenses. So the system can automatically uh, generate a model of, of your lens. I don't have nice illustrations. So what I used is with this slide to show you how you can help yourself with uh, Micmac when you don't know how to do things. The tool for, matching, for finding lens properties is Tapas. So we ask Micmac to run the Tapas tool. And with the help, we have a list of all possible lens models. Of course, the more complex the model is, uh, the better the, the modeling of the lens properties, but the more difficult it is to make it to converge. So it's a, a trade-off between uh, complex models where you have a lot of freedom, but uh, chances of not converging, and uh, basic models with fewer models, uh, poor models, but easier convergence. I just show you the output of uh, uh, um, Tapas here uh, so that you can realize that all these numbers here are errors in pixel. In the very beginning, when you start uh, the model, the lens model is very poor. So you see I have errors of 3 pixel, 11 pixel. That's very bad. If your model is converging properly, you will end up with less than 1 pixel error between your images. So at first, it might uh, be frightening to see these big numbers coming out of Micmac, but actually they are very relevant. They tell you the percentage of type points that have been used and your pixel error. So basically, if your pixel error is not converging towards sub 1 value, well, uh, you're in trouble and, and something went wrong. So at the end, you see that your worst resolution is 1 pixel and residual is about 0 0.9 pixel. The uh, lens was properly modeled, properly modeled. This is working fine. So once you've modeled your uh, lens, you create a coarse cloud. So this is basically to check if Micmac was able to position properly uh, the, 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 the path of a UAV over the, the surface, and if your surface makes sense uh, with respect to what you expect uh, from your DEM. 
Just be careful, I was recently introduced to this paper which shows that self-calibration uh, self of a lens might create very low frequency, large scale distortions, uh, parabolic distortions, which I have seen. So this is a, a, a caveat about self-calibration of a lens, you will create uh, large scale distortions, or you might. And if you look closely, you see here uh, skill tracks well, on the, on here that helped the uh, software uh, match uh, the, the, the features on, on this uh, snow-coated area. Once you've done the coarse point cloud, this is the most time-consuming part. You create the uh, fine point cloud, uh, you create the orthophoto, and you create uh, a correlation map that tells you where you are most confident that your digital elevation model uh, is correct. So what does the fine point cloud look like? Well, here's an example of a fine point cloud of, uh, generated this way. So this is the example of your fine point cloud. You see it's about 10 million points. And you can move around in your fine point cloud that you've generated this way and zoom into the area, whoops, the other way. And you can check the topography of your uh, e digital elevation model. If I can zoom in, yeah. So you see that indeed you have a topography. And as you have in real life, you've got the hills and the valleys that you can check. So here I collected these images. Uh, I have one satellite image of the region I'm interested in. You remember that we removed an offset in my uh, georeference images. I put the offset back. I uh, insert this in my world file so that my data set is georeferenced. I correct for altitude. I get an image in pixels. I, have, I get in an XML file a resolution. So one pixel is 22 centimeters. And if I overlap my DEM, you see that I have the braiding of the rivers. You have fine continuity. If you look at the hill over here, you indeed have something that is relevant with the uh, aerial picture. So the topography is matching uh, the features that we see on the ground. So that's an example of fusion of, uh, QG in QGIS of your digital elevation model with a background um, uh, satellite image. You cannot see it here, but this is a former sat image with two meter resolution. And I get a DEM, whoops, sorry. And I get a DEM with a sub decimeter resolution. So when you zoom in, you really see the difference between the big pixel of a satellite image and the fine pixels of a, D of a UAV. So here is an example of subtracting two DEM. These two DEM were acquired uh, one week apart during uh, this uh, end time interval where there was a big flood. Here is a channel where the river is flowing. And if I take a subtraction, I see this dip here, which is about three meter deep. And does this match reality? Well, I didn't make a, a practical field check, but this is the kind of canyon where the river has carved its path uh, in the moraine that I'm interested in. And indeed, that's pretty much three meter high. So it matches uh, what can be expected from heavy flooding in, in this uh, um, um, uh, brittle material of the moraine where um, landslide has created this digital elevation model difference. Now, closer to you, you might do the same thing. Uh, this is something that was done in the lab. Uh, I collected two digital elevation models of uh, the parking lot next to our uh, laboratory. Uh, and here's an example of acquired acquisition in the end of September, beginning of April. I did the same uh, when returning in May. And when you do this kind of processing, you get the correlation map. So the correlation map tells you that where, where there is grass, of course, grass has very little uh, relevant features so that the Micmac is unable to create a DEM. But on the parking lot and on the uh, um, uh, soil covered area, the correlation is very good. And when you do the digital elevation model, you have the parking lot, you have the cars over here which are parked. And if I do the DEM subtraction, I see which car have moved from the parking lot from one time to the other. So basically this is working pretty well. So as a conclusion to this presentation, I wanted to show you that uh, using aerial uh, images with at least 60% overlap, uh, azimuthal pictures, you can create digital elevation models by first identifying type points, lens properties, which are automatically generated from the images. If you, even if you have a toy camera, uh, you will be able to generate more or less good quality lens models. And you need to get the camera position if you want to have a georeference model. If you just want to have a qualitative model without georeferencing, you don't even need the GPS. Uh, it will handle by itself the relative positions of the cameras. We create a coarse point cloud to make sure that the position of a camera was properly modeled by Micmac. And the result is orthophoto digi digital elevation model and the correlation maps uh, to make sure that we can uh, assess the quality of, of a result. Um, 
If you want uh, some of the examples, we uh, distribute this through the web server of QGIS, so you can connect to this website to have uh, the, the um, uh, open layer uh, version of these uh, results. For the French-speaking audience, a couple of uh, articles were written on Micmac because, again, the excellent documentation is not really introductory. Micmac is a fascinating uh, documentation for knowledgeable users, but here what I was trying to do is to take you by the hand and help you step by step. So this was, again, written in French for for a French audience, if anyone is, inter is interested in open source software for digital elevation modeling, this was done for Autophoto. You can also do this for oblique view modeling of objects. Uh, I will be very happy to translate this uh, to English if anyone wants a, a basic tutorial on Micmac. And with this, I thank you for your attention. If there's any question. <laughs> So the question is uh, the vertical accuracy. What I did is I went on a flat area, made multiple measurements, so multiple flights separated by four or five minutes, and the standard deviation uh, on the parking lot was 11 centimeters. So let's say decimeter resolution. In the moraine here, from two measurements done from two days apart, I get about 60 centimeters. So my current interest is whether I could measure uh, snow cover uh, thickness. 60 centimeter is at the threshold of what can be usable. One of the main reasons of this poor resolution in uh, northern Spitsbergen than what I did in the parking lot is the poor alignment of the 2DEM. On the parking lot, even if you misalign by a few tens of centimeters, it doesn't matter. In the very rough moraine, if you misalign by even a few centimeters, then you have very uh, uh, strong effect. And this is really the conclusion that I could not introduce here, but uh, using ground control point, reference point, is mandatory if you want to have submeter resolution. If you just rely on GPS, this is L1 GPS, you will not have enough resolution. You need some point to introduce uh, GCP to match properly, and then I would expect uh, 10, 20 centimeter vertical resolution. Uh, thanks, it's very interesting. I have two uh, questions. The altitude is uh, calculated by the angle on which the two uh, overlapping fixtures differ. So the question is whether, how, I, how I select my altitude. Actually, my altitude is a trade-off between the pixel resolution. Uh, here you see that five, pix uh, five centimeter is actually much below what I expect. The second one is regulation. I'm not allowed to fly higher than 120 meters. Oh. And to make it safe, I wanted to stay at 100 meters. To tell you the truth, I sometimes went up to 120. But uh, how, can, uh, how does the software calculate the, the, the difference in height? Um, it, will, uh, it will see these in various tie points. It will be able, so the SIFT algorithm has a scaling invariance uh, property. So even if you change the altitude, the software will still be able to find relevant tie points and to compute what was the altitude. Angle yes. So the, the angle doesn't change. Angle is given by the length properties. Yes, this is a given. The, length, the length properties are fundamental. Yeah. But what you will change is the area that is covered here, and this area will be dependent on the height. But the length must not change. This is a very strong requirement. These fixed lens cameras are perfect. But if you have an automated camera, you must not change the zooming or the length properties to get this to work. If anything changes, then your calibration is wrong, and everything fails. Yeah. A second question, if I'm allowed to. Um, uh, did you try, or maybe someone in the public can say, uh, whether you can convert this model to something that can be printed on a 3D printer? So the question is whether we can 3D print this. Uh, it's going to be too long now to answer, but the short answer is yes. I printed this on a 3D printer, and it works. Yes. But you have to be careful to get rid of uh, all the outline points. So it, it's, I did it manually in Beamer, and it, you have to clean it uh, in Blender. Does lightning affect the uh, picture matching, like the time of the day take a picture? The, so the question is uh, the effect of lightning. Uh, these DEM were acquired over half a day. I needed uh, five flights, 20 minutes long each. Uh, I never correlate this flight with this one. But one flight is 20 minutes. Over 20 minutes, I have l l l uh, uh, few enough lighting condition change that I have seen the failure. So it should affect, but I have not seen this on the short flights I'm using. So, 
on, on, so I have flown here with winds up to 25, meter per, uh, 25 km per hour, sorry, because the, 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 the UAV can fly up to 10 meters per second. So above 2 to 3 meters per second, I would not advise flying. Now, I'm lucky enough to go on the field trip for three weeks uh, at a time, and I will wait for the right conditions. Of course, if you go somewhere and you expect to fly immediately, chances of so the day I flew with 25 km per hour wind was we were way, going to a unique site, and I had to fly. I had to try it, uh, but I wouldn't advise it. Did you try to do the same approach with thermal imaging? So the question is about thermal imaging. Uh, the problem is that you need high resolution features to, uh, the, for a correlation match. I believe that IGN, IGN the, the French uh, Geographic Institute, has this kind of investigation. I have not. One more question. Yeah. Is it right um, for McGillery open structure for motion? I'm sorry? Uh, there's a good open SFM for McGillery. Can you try that one over here? I tried, a f so the question is what other tool, what open source tool may, my, may I have used? Um, I have tried a various SFM software that I could find. Uh, I cannot remember all the uh, features that I used. The, the, the solution is, at the end of the day, I used the one that was, uh, so I have uh, Python, uh, I have some, well, I, I tried a few open source um, uh, software, and the, I, I was confident with, that with the French, Geogra sorry, not French, but Geographic Institute was using this for production, I would be confident uh, that uh, it would be a serious project, not that the others are not, but I was confident in the Geographic Institute, and I got a very good feedback from the group developing this software in, at EGN. So there is no rational why I'm using this, except that I fell in love in it, I fell in love in the philosophy of a developer, and uh, if you take a bit of time to go through the initial uh, difficulties of getting acquired with it, it's so powerful, it's, it meets my requirement. One tool for one step, checking each step. Uh, so I, I have not tried enough the other software to comment on why this one and not the others. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.